everyone. Welcome to uh, the CS50 seminar, iOS app development with Swift. I'm Dan Armendaris. I'm a preceptor of computer science here at, at Harvard. And the next hour is going to be a whirlwind tour of as much stuff uh, about this topic as we can fit. Um, I will post all of the source code that you will see today online. We might not be able to actually go over everything that I'm, that I'm showing you in this hour but at least hopefully through the comments of the source code, you'll be able to try to figure out what exactly is happening for those things that we don't quite get to. Overall, uh, the structure of today's talk will be as follows. We'll start out doing some uh, basic syntax with the Swift language, uh, going into some of the more advanced syntax of the Swift language. Uh, because the language is really modern, uh, it has a lot of high-level features, things that we haven't seen in C through C throughout CS50, or even some of the other languages that we've started using in CS50, like PHP. So I'm going to have to try to introduce also some topics that are related to higher level languages uh, that you may not see in depth in CS50, but you will see in later computer science classes. So it's going to be a tightly uh, packed hour. Uh, feel, please feel free to uh, let me know if you have any questions. So if you are interested in doing development with Swift, or really any iOS app development, um, y th there are a couple of requirements. First of all, you have to be using a Mac, uh, running uh, in the examples that we're going to be using today, a relatively new version of OS X. In this case, I'm running 10.10.5. Uh, you can be running 10.11 if you want. But everything that you're going to see is involving Xcode 7 and later, which has the latest version of Swift, which is Swift 2.0. This is actually a pretty important distinction. A lot of the syntax has changed pretty significantly in some cases from Swift 1.0, which was released last year, to Swift 2.0, which just came out this fall. So we're going to show Swift 2.0 a lot of the uh, things that you search for online when you're trying to determine additional uh, get additional information about a variety of things. You may want to explicitly search for Swift 2 rather than just plain old Swift to make sure that you get the syntax correct. And in fact, this is generally true. There's a, a rapid amount of development happening in the Swift language ever since Apple released it. Um, uh, I think, what, it's been a little over a year now. Um, and things have changed dramatically in that time. And so don't be frustrated if when you're looking around for uh, topics on Swift or how to accomplish something using some example code or something that it doesn't actually work on Swift 2.0, make sure you are looking specifically for that version to try to minimize effects of different versions and, and, uh, and those sorts of things. I'll try to point out just some things that are, that are different to older versions, but it's something to watch out for. That's probably the, going to be one of the biggest headaches that you will have with Swift is finding example code that is older, even just by a few months, trying to use it in your more modern project, and it just simply doesn't work. You're getting compiler errors, syntax errors, all sorts of crazy stuff. So just be patient with that, uh, and you will hopefully have a pretty nice experience with Swift overall. Now, you can actually join, and I hope we actually still have this this year, uh, CS50's Apple de app development team, which will allow you to install any apps that you create on your iOS devices. So take a look at this URL if you are interested in doing that. So just a couple of things about Swift itself. It is a compiled language, uh, but you will see that some of the features that we use allow it to be used also in a bit like an, inter in an interpreted way as well. A lot of the syntax and is borrowed from C. It's based in and written in C. Uh, and so we will see that there are uh, a lot of takeaways from your existing knowledge from C that we can port to Swift. But there are things that make it very different from C. It is very strongly typed. There's automatic memory management. You're not going to have to use malloc or free anywhere. It's designed for generality. So in other words, you can use it in all sorts of contexts from Apple Watch to iPhone all the way up to OS X and uh, even some servers, um, even some scripting. But we'll see that the support for scripting isn't quite there yet as it is in other languages. So most likely, you'll be using this exclusively for development on your Mac or your iPhone. And it has a lot of optional, it has, uh, sorry, a lot of modern features. And a lot of these things are stuff that we're going to try to address today, but also are topics that, frankly, we can devote entire courses to. In fact, CS51, which is offered next semester, focuses a lot on these topics that are described below. So you can spend an entire semester understanding these things, but we're going to try to get through them at least enough that you can understand what's going on when you look at a Swift program and be able to hack your way 
through it for the final project. Now, one of the best ways that you can get additional information on this is frankly just through Apple's provided documentation for Swift. There's a lot of APIs that are available, and this is a good home base for you to look for specific things that you want to do with an API involving iOS. If you want to use the camera, for example, you can start looking here and also use Google and Stack Overflow as you actually, uh, as you would normally. Any questions on this before we jump right in? All right. Let's move on. So first, I have a number of example files, and I'm going to try to step through them relatively quickly. This is the Hello World file for Swift. It's very simple. Uh, there's way more comments than there are actual code. Notice the actual code is at the very bottom on line 14. It says print, and then it's a function call. We're passing into it a string called Hello CS50. Notice that there's no semicolons. Notice that there's no int main. There's none of the, the, the cruft that we had with C. When we are using uh, Swift in this way, which is just written in a text file and stored on my computer, then I can compile it and run it. Notice that here I'm not using the CS50 IDE. This assumes that I am running and that, I, that I'm on OS 10 and that I have Xcode already installed on this machine in order for this to actually function. But this is just a normal text file that we can then uh, compile and edit. So let's see how this actually works. What if I want to compile it? Swift C 1.swift. After a moment or two, it will see that we have now compiled this into a file called 1, and now we have printed our CS50, our, our Hello World uh, application, rather. Notice one other thing as well is that by default, we didn't have to input a backslash n to print a new line. By default, the print function in Swift will print a new line for you. You can pass an optional additional parameter to tell it not to do so, but Google for more information on that. By default, it will uh, do the print line. All right, so let's move on then to some other things. So how can we actually define variables? We can do that using one of two methods. And the one that I want to tell you about first is this let definition. And this is important because effectively what we are doing is defining a constant. We are going to create a variable, or rather a constant, called name, provide to it some data, in this case the string dan. But by using this let keyword, we are saying that this variable, and, or again constant, called name is never going to be changed. It's going to be immutable throughout the duration of this program, or throughout the, the, uh, the, con the duration of the context that that variable is available. This is really important that when you have some data that is not going to change in your program, and we'll see a variety of examples about when we want to use let versus the other syntax, it's important that you use let wherever possible because this notifies the language that it is not going to be changed and it can actually perform a lot of optimizations to improve the speed and the safety of your program. And by safety, I mean not let it crash with crazy uh, errors that we might be accustomed to seeing in C. Then we can uh, use string interpolation to encapsulate this within a string, as we can see in this print line, print hello, and then using backslash open parens and then the name of my variable, or in this case constant, uh, close the parentheses. I am essentially then putting the contents of this variable called name inside of this string and then printing the result there. There's one other change to this file, which is that I have at the very top put in a shebang line, which basically just specifies that I want to use the Swift interpreter, which means that I no longer have to compile this particular program. I can just run it like its own script. But this is, in this case, behind the scenes being compiled and then being run. It's just invisible to us. All right, so let's move on. So there's a bit of trickery that just happened before. I showed you that I could define a constant, and I could provide some data to it. But in this case, notice that I didn't actually specify the type of data that it is. And that's because the compiler, Swift, can infer the type of data just based on the data that I put into it. Because it knows that by evaluating this variable right here, this data right here, it knows that it is a string. And so this constant name is therefore going to be a string as well. But we can also be explicit about the type that's that we're going to use for constants or variables by using this syntax instead. Let name colon string equals Dan. 
which in this case means that we're going to define a constant called name. It's going to be of type string, and the value is going to be Dan. Now, the other way that we can create variables, and these are mutable variables, which means that we are, in fact, going to change their contents th sometime in the duration of the context that that variable is defined. We use the var keyword instead of let. But again, by default, unless you know that you need to manipulate that data, try to use let for performance improvements. In this case, I can then do uh, specify the type of data that is we expect to be inside of this new variable called label. Uh, it's going to be a string, and we're going to then concatenate two strings together, the string hello and the string represented by the variable, or rather the constant name. So this is nice because this is somewhat PHP-like in that we have very easy string concatenation. We don't have to automatically use uh, any sort of memory management to increase the size and do any sort of funny, funny things there. This works as we would actually expect. All right. Any questions on this? Now, the reason that we need to have the ability to be able to define what type of data variables are is because sometimes we don't want to initialize variables with some data at the point of definition. So in this case, let's say that I want to input, start inputting some grades into a gradebook. Well, I know that one of the variables that I want to be is going to be a mutable grade. And, this, and we also know that if we want it to be an integer, but maybe we don't yet have that grade available. In Swift, you have to define the type of data that is associated with a variable or a let uh, constant before you can actually use that variable. It will, it, it, because it is strongly typed, you have to associate a type with these variables. So in this case, if I have not properly initialized it first with some value, then I need to tell Swift what I expect the data type to be. And it is going to remain that same data type throughout the history of this program. Now you might be tempted as soon as I have created this grade variable and provided it an integer of 100. Now if I want to try to concatenate a string with that integer, you might be tempted to still use that string concatenation operator like we did just a few lines before. But unfortunately, this will actually not work because you are essentially performing an operation on two different types. Now this is very different from, uh, from other languages like PHP, which are really loosey-goosey with their sort of types. They're just like, yeah, whatever, I don't care. Just give me one type and maybe I'll do the right thing. In this case, Swift is extremely strict about the types that you are dealing with. This summation operator or concatenation operator has essentially a couple of different possible options. You can do summation with integers or you can do string concatenation and perhaps some other things as well. But if that operator doesn't recognize what is on either side of it, or rather the combination of those two types, isn't uh, what it's expecting, then it's going to cause a failure. So in this case, what does it mean to have a string plus an integer? Well, in the context of this, we probably want to do a string concatenation operation. But uh, the, of course, the, the computer doesn't have that sort of context. And so we need to provide it that additional information uh, to let it know what it is that we want to do. So in other words, the fact that Swift is strongly typed means you have to do a little bit of additional work to get it to operate the way that you would want. But as a result, it is safer. And once you have taken into account those types, things just frankly start to work pretty well. So in this case, we then would perform a string concatenation by explicitly casting the integer to a string by wrapping it in this capital S string function and then using the string concatenation operator to modify our label variable and then print it out. So far, so good? All right, let's move on. Now, there are a variety of data types that we can use in Swift as you have become accustomed to. We can create a mutable array and that array can only contain a single type. So in this case, we're going to create a mutable array of integers, which we will call grades, and we will be able to store that in this square bracket format as you've grown accustomed in a variety of other languages. But notice that here we're defining a couple of things. Grades is a mutable variable. It is, we not use the let keyword, so that means that we can then modify the contents of this array. Uh, it is of type uh, array int, and you, we can tell that based on these square brackets here. 
Now, one of the nice things about this is that we have access to a lot of additional information about the, uh, the array just using some simple dot notation. So for example, grades.count provides to us the number of items that exist in that array, which we can then access pretty easily uh, simply using that dot notation. If you want to add additional items to this array, you cannot do the PHP style where you just, uh, just explicitly define at a given index some value that you want to insert. Instead, use the append method for in the, uh, in, in the grades, in, rather in the array type, to append that item 95 to this list. So now this array can, has the following contents, 100, 0, 90, 85, and now we've appended 95 to that as well. But there are other ways that we can append things. You can actually uh, use a summation operator, uh, which will be interpreted as an array append operation. And you can then append another array, 70 and 80, whose contents are 70 and 80, to that array. So now we have the contents in this variable grades, 100, 0, 90, 85, uh, 95, 70, and 80. This is just a nice little syntactic sugar that Swift provides to us. So if we want to sum the grades, we're perhaps going to want to iterate over every item in this loop. And we do have in Swift the notion of a for loop, as you would expect. But the way that we indicate a range is slightly different. So in this case, we're going to, to sum everything. We'll create a temporary variable called sum in, or in order for us to maintain this count. And notice our for loop construction here, for index, in zero dot dot less than sign grades dot count. So this construction, zero dot dot less than grades dot count, is a range operation where we are saying that we are going to create a range of integers from zero up to but excluding grades dot count. So this will be zero, one, two, three, four, five, up until what, however many, one before grades dot count. So this is different than uh, how we would typically use for loops where you would uh, have some index variables, set it equal to zero at first, and then iterate that until uh, uh, some value less than the count of items in that array. So there is a modification to this, actually, which allows us to very easily set uh, different types of ranges. If you change this range to three dots, zero dot 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 grades dot count, this represents the range zero to grades count uh, inclusive meaning that that number is also then included in that range. But this is very handy for these exact things when we have to perform iterations over a loop because those indexes are zero indexed as we have seen in other languages as well. Any questions on this for loop? So there's an implicit definition of this index variable whose, begins, uh, whose value begins at zero and continues at every loop iteration to increase by one up until the point that it is equal to grades.count, at which point the loop aborts. Notice that in our string uh, interpolation here, we can actually perform some simple manipulations to those values. So index plus one will actually perform a summation of that value because index is, in this case, an integer. Uh, and at that point, it will then be converted into a string and interpolated into this string here and printed out as we would expect. And well, the nice thing about the arrays here is that we are also able to have uh, um, uh, fetching values and setting values using the square bracket notation as we've seen in other languages as well. OK. All right, so from here, we've now computed our sum of all of our grades. Now sort of the next logical step would be to do a division operation to find out the average of those grades. But something important here is happening, which is that this sum is perhaps an integer, but we need to perform some sort of double division. And this is going to be extremely important when we want to perform this operation, because what we are saying is that we need to actually perform division on two doubles. And again, because Swift is very strongly typed, we must explicitly set all of the items two doubles before we actually perform that operation. So in order for us to perform double division, it's not sufficient for just one of those items to be a double. Both of them have to be a double in order for Swift to be sure that this is what we want to, uh, th this is what we want to do. So we will then explicitly typecast the sum, which we've computed above, 
and the count of grades to doubles and then perform that operation and store that into this new variable or rather this new constant called average which will have what type you imagine double yeah so in this case we don't have to specify it because it can be inferred from the operation what type of data average will be um, and Swift is generally pretty good about being able to infer the types okay do you want to see this run or can I move on I want to keep keep going any questions on any of this great okay now we're going to start to get to the good stuff defining functions and a couple of other types that are unique to Swift that you have not seen in other languages up until this point but there are, they, they are present in other languages that, that you might find uh, later on. So first, if you want to define a function, you define it with the func keyword, function, and then the function name, and then in parentheses, the arguments that you want that function to accept. The arguments must also specify, generally, must also specify the type of data that they are, unless they can be inferred. And we'll see that little caveat in just a little bit. So in this case, we have a function called print grade count. We're going to accept a variable or rather in this, in this case a constant called gradebook and it is going to be of type array of integers. Now there's something that's really important here that I want you to understand. That is that by default these uh, arguments that are input to this function are defined with an implicit let keyword. Which means that I cannot modify this gradebook, uh, this gradebook um, variable here. And that sort of makes sense because you're passing data in and you perhaps don't want it to be changed from under you. It is possible to uh, explicitly mention that this is a variable by putting a var keyword here, but that is a gotcha that we've noticed people have, have, uh, that people have done in the past is that they assume that it is going to be a variable when in fact it is a constant. All right, so here then, in this case, we are not specifying any return type. We'll show you how to do that in just a moment. But notice that here we have just a simple if condition. If the gradebook is empty, which in this case is just a property of this uh, integer array, then we print out something. Otherwise, we do something else. Pretty straightforward so far, I think. But stop me if you have any questions. Now, this function, average, also takes some arguments, or rather one argument, which is the gradebook. And this time, it is going to return a double type because it has computed the average and it's going to actually return that computed average to the calling uh, to the to the calling line. In this case, we specify the return type after an arrow. And this might feel kind of weird at first. You know, it, it you, you've grown accustomed to setting the the return type before the name of the function. But if you think of this in terms of mathematics, like when you, when you have mathematics that define a function, you have a function with some inputs and it produces an output. And that's exactly what this is supposed to mimic. And there's a couple of other languages that have similar syntax as well, but probably none that you've seen in CS50. But still, don't be confused by it. The arrow means what is going to be returned in this case. OK, so how are we going to compute this average? Well, if the gradebook is empty, well, then we're going to return 0, which is maybe a reasonable way to treat this? I don't know. Let's come back to that in a little bit. This may not actually be a reasonable way to compute an average if we have an empty gradebook. Then we'll just perform our summation. Uh, notice that here we actually have an alternate version of a for loop, which allows us to iterate over every single item in an array and place each element into its own, uh, into its own variable. By specifying for grade and gradebook, what we are saying is that we're going to create in, uh, implicitly create a new constant called grade that is going to represent every unique item in the gradebook every time that the for loop iterates. So the first time that it's run, grade will be the first item in the gradebook. The second time, it will be the second item, so on and so forth, until gradebook has exhausted itself of elements. Then we will be able to sum that grade into our summation variable and return our average as we've seen before. OK, any questions? Yes. If, so, uh, can you repeat that question? Can I do integer as the average? Can you do integer as an average, so return an integer average instead of a double? Return, you know, you have that right now below. Right here, return 0.0? 0. 0. 
so in so in that case, so there's a couple different ways to answer that. Let me answer them in uh, in order. So if I just make this return zero, a zero is an integer value, and so that will cause a type error for this case because it is expecting a double, but it is then returning an integer. If I want to return an integer, I can. I can return. Uh, I can set the the return type to int return zero here and not perform double division, but then we would be doing integer division, and so we then wouldn't get the average that we would possibly expect. But yes, we can modify the types in that way. And secondly, you have the one double on the top, but down below when you're doing return double double, that's already automatically doing double format. Why do you still need to define it with the arrow on top with the double? So in this case, this is part of the, so to repeat the question, why uh, it, because it's implicit from the return types here, what type this actually is. Um, we need to be explicit with Swift about what we want to return out of this function so that when it performs type checking, it can, can, it can make sure that what we have actually written down below actually conforms to that. So it's sort of like a, a check with yourself sort of situation. But there are, there are cases when we can specify that we do, that we do not want to, uh, that that we can implicitly set the return type. Um, but in this case, I don't think that would work. There's, there's some other syntax that we'll see in later. OK? All right, so um, this source code is a little bit different because this parses arguments from the, uh, from the, the function that we're calling. Um, let me show you how it works before we actually move on to some interesting things that happen in Swift. So in this case, if I just run this code, notice that what it is doing is, well, it kind of gives me a weird error. Uh, I need to pass it a couple of integers in the pr as uh, command line arguments. So let's see, 150 and 80, and hit Enter to find out what it is actually doing. It's accepting each of these values as integers. It's then inputting them into a grade book, and then it is performing that average calculation and outputting that as we would expect. But obviously, there's something going on with this rejecting something, something as, uh, is it an integer? As you might recall uh, from when we are dealing with command line arguments in C and in other languages, the very first the zeroth item in that command line argument list is the name of the command that we actually executed. So in this case, I'm just looping over all of the command line arguments, but I'm not doing any sort of fancy check to skip over that first one. I'm just explicitly or I'm implicitly checking which of these types are integers before I actually perform this computation. And that's, ex that's essentially what's happening here. For every argument in the process's arguments, I'm going to perform some check. And in this case, I'm going to try to first convert that argument into an integer by explicitly by performing an explicit typecast because it is uh, on input a string and not in fact an integer. But this is kind of a weird syntax. If let grade equals int argument, what is actually happening here is extremely important to your using Swift. This is using what's called an optional type. So this function, int argument, returns not just an integer, but it returns what's called an optional integer. And so this is sort of a, a, a type on top of a type. You can sort of imagine it like it's returning this, uh, like a package. And when you open that package, it either has an integer, which is the result, or it has absolutely nothing in it at all. And this is useful as an error checking mechanism because in this case, we can find out, was this type conversion successful? If it was, then it is, in fact, going to have an integer inside. Otherwise, it's going to have some value that we'll call nil, which is representative of no integer at all. It's really representative of nothing. And so this if construction allows us to unwrap that package, that optional binding. And if we are able to unwrap that package and find an integer inside, then what we are saying here is that we will then allow that value to be set into this constant called grade. And this portion of the if statement, the top portion of the if statement, will run because that unwrap was successful. If it just so happens that there was an error, perhaps, in this explicit type conversion from a string to an integer, maybe it's the value abc, for example, and that's actually not going to convert to an integer, then it will return nil, which is not an integer, 
And this if statement will then fail. Grade will not exist because it has no integer content. And we, it will run this else block instead. Yes? So nil is NIL? Nil is NIL, yes. So this is maybe one of the hardest things about Swift, especially when you're in the weeds on, in an iOS app and you're actually trying to perform some, uh, to do some development there. It's going to be yelling at you about optionals and it's going to be asking you for question marks and exclamation points. But once you figure out, if you devote some time to figuring out what is going on with optional types, it will save, you will save yourself a lot of headache as you are trying to write an app in Swift. And it's actually a very powerful feature, and you know, just have to take my word for it for now, but we'll see this construction and some others like it in some of the other source code that we'll show you in just a little bit. But any initial questions here? So the important takeaway is that an optional type is sort of a meta type. It either has a value, and if it does, then it will perhaps have that, that value associated with it, or it has no value whatsoever, and it is represented by nil. OK. And the rest of this is perhaps as you would expect. <laughs> All right, so let's ramp up the difficulty yet again. And this time, let's take a look at some other data types that actually exist. One of them is dictionaries, which is very similar to Python dictionaries. It's somewhat similar to a hash table in, uh, in C. It is essentially a mapping of keys, where keys can be strings. And when you look up those keys, those keys will have a value. So it's not quite an array, but instead more closely associated to a hash map or a hash table. Let's see how this is supposed to work before we actually go into the source code itself. If I just run this, nothing really happens. It's telling me that I want to, I am expecting some parameters of the following type. So I'm going to provide it to it some problem set names, some p set zero, maybe I got 100, then p set one, I got a five, and then in the exam, I did really well and got a 30. And oops, I hit a space here. When I hit enter, you can see it performs some computation. It says the gradebook has three grades, PSET 1, PSET 0 exam, and the gradebook has this specific average. So again, we're working with this gradebook idea, but we're going to continue iterating with the complexity of our, uh, of our function. So at the onset, we're just going to create a function that is responsible for printing the usage, and there's this exit function which will just forcibly quit the application. This is not something that you will use in an iOS app. This is only in this case, for the command line argument, next we'll start moving towards Xcode. But this is specific to a command line style program in Swift. Let's take a look at some of the interesting things here. Uh, let's see, a couple of, only a couple of interesting things to mention perhaps is that in my function of printing the number of grades, I can, uh, you might recall that I had that list of items, pset one, pset zero, and exam. You can actually quickly and easily do this by taking the gradebook, which is a dictionary, which has keys and values, find all of the keys through the dot keys method here, and then use this join with separator, which will then take all of the keys that we had typed in, pset one, or sorry, pset zero, pset one, and exam, and concatenate them together using a comma and a space to create one long string. This join operation is just phenomenally useful in, in a variety of contexts. And so it is this join with separator. And this is one thing that's changed from Swift 1 to Swift 2. There used to be a Python style, if you're familiar with Python, a Python style join uh, method on strings. But that is no longer the case in Swift 2. You want to use this if you want to concatenate an array of stuff together uh, with a string. So Perhaps then, in our discussion of average before, it makes a little bit more sense for us to set uh, the average function to be an optional double rather than just an explicit double. Because we had that unusual condition where what if gradebook actually has no values within it? What should the average return? Well, maybe in C, you would have done something like provided a sentinel value, like 0.0, .0 or maybe a negative number or something, just representing the fact that there is some 
error condition and you perhaps do not actually have the ability to compute that average. Well, the beauty of specifying uh, in, in, in uh, an optional type would be to do that, and I'm now saying all these words, but this actually does not use optionals. But we'll see that in just a minute, where uh, we, we can set average to be an optional data type so that if it actually returns some data, then we will return that data. Otherwise, we will return nil, saying that this has no meaningful computation. Let's move on to uh, something else. So from here, we've been looking at all of these examples in the command line. But really, what you're going to be dealing with is Xcode. And one of the nice things about Xcode is, and specifically in Swift, is that we have this uh, we have this thing called a playground. And a playground is not at all an iOS app, but it allows you to experiment with Swift in a very easy way. You can type all of your code. It's nicely syntax highlighted here. When you create a new file, it will ask you if you want to create a playground. But the nice thing about the playground is that on the right of your, um, of your window, does it actually show you output from your code? So if I scroll down, we can see what the output of various lines of code actually happens to be. So in this case, we're going to uh, change directions just a little bit and talk about something that's really important to this high level way that Swift operates. And it is this idea of closures. And you're probably seeing this a little bit in JavaScript, for those of you that are in CS50. Uh, you will, closures are, are very popular, a very good way of doing high-level things in modern languages. But it is also kind of difficult to wrap your head around the first time. So if you don't get it this first time, that's OK. Just look at this source code and see if you can figure it out um, at home. So in this case, let's say that we want to create a lot of exponents with, uh, uh, with, with some fixed value. So in this case, I can create a function. I'm going to call it power of 2 and whose sole purpose in life is to take some input and double it and return that value. Notice that here I, have, I am accepting one type of uh, data. Uh, it's going to be a variable called x. It's of type double, and I'm going to return a double here. And I'm just going to do a very, frankly, pretty naive way of doubling this value. And I'll show you why this is useful in just a second. Notice that here we have this, this range again for something in 1 dot 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 2, which means that this loop will run twice. But this underscore represents a dummy variable. It means that I'm not really going to be using that variable anywhere inside of this loop. I just want this, this, this line of code to run twice without needing to know the value of that range. So in this case, I'm running result times x twice, which essentially means that I am squaring this uh, this value. And this happens to work as we would, as we would expect. Power of 2, uh, uh, passing in a value of 2.0, gives us an output of 4. 3.2 works for 10.24. Now we can do a similar thing for power of 3, but now ch change only the range for dummy variable in 1 through 3, multiply it 3 times, and do the same thing. So this might feel a little contrived, but there's an important thing here, which is that Looking at these two functions, there's only one thing that's different, which is this value in the range. Everything else about these two functions, power of 3 and power of 2, are in fact identical because they work in the same way. So at this point, little alarm bells should be going off, hopefully, in this, in where you're saying, you know, this feels a little bit like duplication of, uh, of effort. Perhaps there's a way that I would be able to encapsulate all of this and provide a function or create a function that does exactly what I want without needing to type it out explicitly. And this is what the power of a closure allows us to do. So let's take a look at this, and I'll spend a couple of minutes on this because this is pretty important for Swift. You, we see this all of the time. Is We're going to define a function. It's going to be called power of. It's going to accept a parameter called y of type int. But take a look at the return type. The return type is in parentheses, double arrow double, which means that this function, this function power of, is returning a function that is accepting a double and returning a double. 
So that might sound kind of crazy, but let's scroll down a little bit and look to see what happens. We're inside of this function, power of, we're creating a new function called exponentiator, but it doesn't matter what it is. Notice that this has an input value of x, and it is in taking in a double and returning a double. And this is the same code that we saw above, except that the value of 2 or the value of 3, that, val that upper bound in that range, has been replaced with this value y, which was the initial parameter of our power of function. And at this point, we return exponentiator. We are returning the function. It's kind of, if, it's kind of like a little mind-blowing. But let's imagine what happens when I call this function power of and pass into it some value like 2. What this means is that I now have the value 2 for y, which means that this value y in this exponentiator function will be that value 2. But I am returning this exponentiator function. So notice what Swift says I have created in this case. Let square is a definition, it's a function that accepts a double and returns a double. I have created a function that squares something using this mechanism right here. And really what's happening is that it has returned this function exponentiator, but this value y is wrapped inside of it. And so now every time I use this, this variable or this constant called square, it is going to behave as a function. And so I can then call that variable like I would call a function and pass into it a, a, a number, like in this case 3, and I will then square this value. So 3 squared will then become 9, as we can see here. Pretty crazy, but this now allows me the opportunity to create other power of functions. Like I can say, OK, well, now I want to create a new function, power of 3, and store that into a constant called cube. And now cube is going to be a separate function that will then take some value as input and cube that value, as we can see in the bottom line here. The cube of 2 is going to result in 8. Pretty, hopefully pretty neat stuff. If you've never seen this before, um, I, I encourage you to look into closures and, and investigate this a little bit more. It's really powerful stuff. We see it a lot in JavaScript and some other languages. And it's really vital to understanding APIs as well that we'll get to in just a second. Yes? Could Question? Could we do power of two parentheses and then another parentheses in our two, another input? Uh, Basically so look at the very last line here. It is actually totally possible to do that chaining as you, uh, as you suggested. So power of 5 means that we're going to have an exponentiator of 5 up here. So this is essentially going to be the same thing as 4 to the fifth power because we've created an exponentiating function to the fifth power and then we're passing into that function the value 4. And we get to that value that we expect, 10, 1,024. Right, exactly. So before I, sp I just put it into a, a, into a constant here so that it made it easy to use that, that name. Yes? So in this case, power of is simply the name of the function that I defined up here. So it's not inherent to the language itself, but instead it's just the function that has that name because I gave it that name. Any other questions? All right. Now, this is great, but you're not going to see a lot of closure functions that are like this, where you define inside of one function another function. I mean, you can do it, but it's kind of not really necessary, right? Like, why do I define this function called exponentiator and then immediately return it? Why can't I just immediately return this function? And in fact, this is precisely the idea behind a concept called anonymous functions, where anonymous functions do not actually have a name because they don't need to have one. And so in this case, in 7b, we can find precisely that. It's all the same code. It does exactly the same thing. But now we've changed it slightly so that this power of function immediately returns a function. Notice that the return after return, there's an open uh, curly bracket is going to input it's expecting this input double. It's expecting that output double. 
and then the in keyword separates the code itself. So this is an anonymous function. It doesn't actually have a name, whereas before it was called exponentiator. But as we saw, it just we really didn't refer to exponentiator outside of that function, so it didn't matter. So this anonymous function is so called because it, it is nameless, but it is still being used in the context of this code. OK. The next couple ones I'm going to continue, like hopefully blowing your mind a little bit. We can simplify this even more. Because as was astutely pointed out earlier, perhaps we actually know by inferring from this code what the output of this code is going to be. And in fact, in this anonymous function, we can in fact infer the types of data. So in this one, we no longer need to explicitly define the type of data that's being input and output from this function for a couple of reasons. One is that we have defined up at the prototype of the, uh, the enclosing function what type of data this anonymous function, sh function should input and output. And from the other, we can infer from the code down here that we are accepting an input and uh, that is of type double and returning a double. Notice that here we have not explicitly defined the names of the arguments that this, uh, that this function is accepting. And so we see we can refer to those parameters using dollar sign zero, dollar sign one, so on and so forth, depending on the number of that parameter used in this function. This is something that you are going to see a lot, is this open curly bracket definition followed by a dollar sign zero and then some operation and then a closed curly bracket. That is an anonymous function that performs this operation. It has this parameter uh, with its type is where its type is inferred. That first parameter is dollar sign zero and some operation is happening on that dollar sign zero. So the dollar sign parameter basically in zero means the first one. That's correct. So the dollar sign basically means parameter, and zero means the first one. Uh, but it works specifically in this case where I have not named the arguments in my uh, in my anonymous function. It's Does just the curl with something have the dollar sign and the dollar zero in there. There's which? I'm sorry. Uh, does the curl have the, the dollar zero? Dollar I'm not too familiar with Perl, but PHP has yeah. dollar has. Uh, well, it defines variables based on dollar signs, and there may be some languages that have. Um, features like this. In fact, Swift borrows a lot of features like this from a lot of other languages. We see hints of Python in it. Um, this definition of types seems to come from OCaml. And we have just a whole bunch of stuff from lots of different languages. That's one of the nice things about Swift is that it takes a lot of the best ideas from a bunch of languages and shoehorns them all together into one uh, super language. And in fact, if you'll allow me to continue blowing your mind, so we've, do, we've been doing all of this, we can perhaps simplify this a little bit by saying that, well, by realizing that, of course, Swift has the power, has, has an exponentiating function built in. If I import Darwin, which is just a library that features this function called pow, now I can simplify my power of function to be the following. It is going to be returning this anonymous function. But look at how simple this is now. This is an anonymous function that is accepting some type of data. And it is going to be uh, one, one argument specifically referenced at dollar sign zero that is of type double. And it is going to return a type double. But the return statement is now implicit. And it is this exact style that is very, very prevalent in Swift all over the place. We're going to see this all the time in Swift. So I'm showing all of this to you because of this syntax. This is very common to see, which means it is an anonymous function that is performing some operation on these arguments. And there is an implicit return. So it is absolutely the same thing for us to say this right here. Because this curly bracket is a function. We're performing this operation on that first argument. We're going to return that. But this outer return is returning that whole function, that whole anonymous function that we have just created. Any other questions? All right, I don't know if you guys are ready for this, but we can go even crazier with Swift. You ready? OK, this is great. Now we actually have the ability to, in Swift, because of, because of how modular and how protocol-based it is, to define our own freaking operators. Like in this case, we had no operator for exponentiation, for, exp uh, well, for uh, performing 
powers of something, but I can in Swift define a new operator that does precisely that. So in this case, there's a bunch of syntax here, and I'll allow you to look at it at home when you, um, when you look at this. But we are defining this infix operator, star star, which will then allow us, by defining what that function star star actually does, to accept a left-hand side and a right-hand side, and then to return the exponent of that left-hand side to the right-hand side. And so now, all of a sudden, I have created a new operator. So 2 star star 3 means 2 to the third power. Right? This by itself should make you be like, OK, screw C. I'm going, to, I'm going swift all the way. Like, this is great. This is pretty fantastic. Though, um, this is a great example, but I have never once outside of this example actually defined my own operator. But still, you know, it's, it shows a lot of the power of Swift and why this is actually really very cool. Okay. Yes? If you're defining your own operator, how do you know um, you, don't, you don't accidentally try and create an operator that's like hidden somewhere in C, like hidden somewhere in Swift, you know, like this, you know, an obscure one that's not, you, know, you may not have seen before. So, uh, if you're trying to define your own operator, there is the risk of defining one over an existing operator. Um, that goes into a level of detail that I don't think we have time to go over, but it is, um, that is a risk. And that is, in fact, the very reason why I didn't use the caret symbol, which we, when we're typing out power, we usually, we usually use four, a little caret five or something like that, and like just when we're, I don't know, g-chatting our buddies or whatever. But in that case, that actually would have caused um, a collision. And so I avoided it just because I happen to know in this case that that would cause that, that collision. All right. Now, unfortunately, for the last seven minutes, I have to keep blowing your minds a little bit. So allow me to show you some other things as well. We've shown you this idea of having these anonymous functions, these closures that allow you to kind of pass functions around. You can return them. You can manipulate them. You can do all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, but one other thing that happens to be useful is the ability to, as opposed to returning those functions in, in a function, to pass a function as a parameter to another function. You might be thinking, well, why? on earth would I want to do something like that? Well, let's say that I want to take this operator that I worked so hard to create and apply it to a bunch of different numbers in an array. So in this case, I have an array of integers, uh, 1, 4, 7, 2, 5, 10, 56, and I want to double them all. The way that we would typically do it is to just write a simple for loop that iterates over all of them and performs some sort of square operation over them uh, inputting those new values into a new variable, or rather a new array here. And the value, the output of result is then all of those uh, arrays, or rather all of those elements now squared. And we could do the same thing for cubing it, but you know, little alarm bells should be going off saying that maybe there's some way that we would be able to simplify this a little bit. And in fact, there is. What if we could create a function that allows us to accept as a parameter a function. So in this case, take a look at these arguments. We're going to accept a list of doubles. And then we're going to accept a function in a variable called f that is going to take a double and return a double. And the whole output of this entire function called mapper is going to return an array called double. What this would then allow me to do is to iterate over that list and do the same thing, but now apply that function on each of the individual values in that list. So I don't really know what f is. I don't, it doesn't, doesn't matter to me. But so long as it takes in a double, performs some operation on it, and then returns a double, I would then be able to map that function across every single element in a list. And this, is, this type of programming is called higher order functions, where we're passing functions around as parameters and doing things with functions. Uh, it's sort of like taking all of the, these ideas that we've learned in CS50 and taking them sort of to the next level. And this is all CS51 style stuff. And so we'll go in depth more in classes like that. But this is also important here because we see a lot of functions that are used in Swift that essentially does this, where we have 
some numbers, some array of numbers. We're going to pass that array into our mapper. And we're also going to pass the another uh, uh, some function, which we've already defined up here. It's going to be square. And we're going to then square all of those numbers and store that into this result here. So in this case, we've defined our own function called mapper. But this exact thing is, in fact, built into Swift. There are a variety of functions called uh, map. There's a, a map function, there's a reduce function, and there's a filter function, which essentially apply functions to every single element in a list to modify them in some way. So it's a procedure of transforming the data into another format by those functions. Right. Yeah, so we're doing, so the function that we are accepting is transforming the data in some way. In this case, we, was, we were either squaring it or we were cubing it, or really we could have performed no operation on it at all. But let me show you then how this is going to look in practice. And again, I'm going to, we're running a bit out of time, so I'm not going to be able to go over all of the source code here in detail, but I encourage you to do that. We will post it as soon as possible after this, after this talk. But if you take a look at this, assume that we have a list of numbers, an array of numbers in this variable called numbers, then we want to perform this filter operation on those numbers. So filter is a higher order function that accepts an array and also a function. And on every element in that array, it performs that function. And if that function returns true, it keeps that item. If that function returns false, it throws away that item. And then it returns a list that is then made up of all of those items that have been filtered. So in other words, this is the same idea, a grade book. We might have a variety of grades into this value called numbers. It could be 100 and 70 and 40, so on and so forth. What this filter does is notice that this is that syntactic sugar for an anonymous function. This is an anonymous function saying that the, f that the parameter that I am accepting is going to be, if it is greater than 70, then this will return true, meaning that that item will be kept in this filter. So let's be a little bit more concrete about this. If I have this array of numbers, and it consists of 100, uh, 70, and 40, I, perf I perform this filter operation on each one of those. So that first one is this value of 100. 100 greater than or equal to 70 is true, which means that that 100 is kept in this new copy of this array. 70 also passes, but 40 does not. So what is returned in passing count is the array of elements 170, 100, 70. Those were the only two items that were kept. And so the reason that I quickly went through a lot of these kind of high order things are because this is that common thing that you will see in Swift pretty frequently, is performing some operation using this anonymous uh, function syntax. There's some cool stuff, like switches are really powerful in Swift. I mean, just like crazy, crazy powerful. You can, uh, you can use switch and you can actually apply them to ranges, which is kind of crazy, and do fancy, fancy stuff like that. But in the last few minutes, I want to skip ahead quite far and show you a specific example of how we can create an iOS app using Swift. So when you're doing this, you'll have to take a look at, um, on Apple's documentation, they have a lot of really good tutorials for creating your first application. And I encourage you to do that because they take you through all the steps of what exactly to click on to create an iOS application. But here we have this iOS app, and it is, it's a pretty simple app, really. If I run this, let me show you what it looks like. All it essentially does is it pulls from the internet a JSON file that I have stored on a server. And that JSON file defines images that allow me to then cycle through on my app images from my web server. So I have here, get next image. It loads an image from the internet and then displays it on the screen. So it's pretty simple, but the goal here is to show you how we can combine things from 
the latter few weeks of CS50 into an actual iOS application. In other words, it's perhaps some of the, the most, uh, perhaps one of the things that you will want to do is to have an iOS application that can pull data from the internet and show the user some information. And that is entirely the point of this source code here. So there's a lot to be said about how to do actual iOS development. There is some, uh, a lot of crazy syntax that we haven't seen quite yet, like a class, what a class actually is. Um, we can largely ignore that for, for the time being. Uh, but notice that we have contained within this a variety of things that we've already seen, like functions that have specific names. Um, and when we uh, give those functions the correct names that are expected by iOS, in fact, this feels a little bit magical, but when you create an iOS application, there are specific function names that are called by the phone itself as the application is loading to try to create the process that actually runs your application. So again, there's a lot of things that I have to gloss over here in order for us to, uh, to talk about this specifically, but I encourage you to look at um, perhaps the uh, the other iOS seminar, but also some of the tutorials online, which do a much better job of describing this specific information. But we can see a couple of things that are interesting from the code here. Notice that we have you know, if statements. By the way, one important thing about if statements is that the parentheses around the Boolean expression are optional, but the curly braces are not optional, no matter how few or many lines of code you have in an if statement. You, can, uh, you cannot have an if statement without curly braces in Swift. Uh, and this is, well, it's sort of silly, but uh, there's historical reasons for that. It's supposed to save you from yourself. Like this, for example, you cannot eliminate the curly braces around that if statement. Those are, in fact, required. So I encourage you to take a look at this, but there's one more construct that I want to show you about Swift that is new to Swift uh, 2.0 compared to older versions of Swift, um, which is the following. Let's see, where did I put it here? So in this function called fetchjson, this function is responsible for pulling that JSON file from, uh, from a URL, which just so happens to be running on my CS50 IDE. I just started Apache, put my JSON file there, and I'm able to then pull that data from the internet using this function, nsurl, which is provided by the phone. It's provided by a library that you use when you're creating, uh, when you're doing some iOS app development. Notice here that there is this unusual syntactical construct called guard. And really, all this is in Swift is a way of verifying that some things have been met before you proceed with the rest of a function. So I could have, using this optional type, I could have found the URL by running this nsurl uh, function and uh, storing that into a URL constant and then checking to see if URL was nil because it is going to return an optional type. And if it was nil, then I would pr uh, print out an error and then return. But instead, what guard lets us do is that very thing, but ensure that it is actually the case that URL has been properly set by nsurl. And if it is, then it skips over this, and it will allow you to proceed with URL having been properly defined. But if it is the case that URL is not properly defined, if this function returns an error or some other unexpected thing actually occurs, this guard construct allows us to then output that error and return immediately. Yes? So it's kind of like an if then else? It's kind of like an if then else, yes. Except that um, this URL is then defined all the way for everything below this. If it passes this guard, then it will actually be uh, filled with data and, and usable in the remaining um, in the remaining uh, source code in your, in your function. So I suspect that you're going to start to see this guard as well and uh, be mindful of that. So just looking at a couple of other things, um, this 
right here is what do you think? Just based on what we were talking about before. This will run in the list. So this is so that's so that's close. This is a function that we are defining, and we are inputting that function as an argument to this function here. If error is not nil, so that is, uh, so I have to scroll. No, I see, I can't really scroll to the right here. Error is an argument that is being passed to this anonymous function. This is an anonymous function. It has no name, but we are accepting these three arguments, data, response, and error. And it is going to return void, so it's not going to return anything. And this is the contents of that function. And then we have access inside of that function to each of these arguments. So it's a whirlwind tour of the language, but I hope with this, hopefully as you take a look at some of the tutorials specific to iOS development with Swift, especially if you go to Apple's developer webpage, they have a lot of really good tutorials to get you started. But hopefully just this hour of talking about the syntax itself has given you enough to get started with that. We will post all of this source code uh, on the seminar website as soon as possible, and also the slides so you have a reference for all of those. Um, but, it's, but you know, good luck with your projects, and thank you all very much for, uh, for coming.